Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I'm excited everyone is back this, this afternoon. Uh, those of you that are online with us and then those of you who may be viewing this later at some point uh, from the recording. I, you know, I have to admit, I, I love American history and I love doing the countdown to revolution because I think sometimes uh, if we haven't thought about it in a long time, people think, you know, all of this happens, you know, there's a Boston Tea Party, there's a Boston Massacre, and then voila, we're at war with Britain. And I tell people, no, it was really a slow process. It was a, you know, let's try and talk things out. Let's reconcile. Is there a way we can make all of this work? Um, and then, of course, it comes to the revolution and it comes to then our declaring ourselves as an independent nation. So what I'm, I have tried to organize myself today so that I will get finished, maybe so that there's enough time that we can can talk about some of the ideas, but I'm sort of going to take us step by step by step, sort of those footprints that will lead us from where we stopped last week with the French and Indian War, which I always look at as a precursor to the American Revolution, and then we will move forward. And then next week when we come back, we'll be able to actually begin organizing troops and, you know, putting um, George Washington really hitting the field with the Continental Line and then the state militias coming together and we will actually then begin to fight the war next week, which is kind of a nice place to, to hit as we go into November. So let's pick up and start. Last week we were talking about the French and Indian War and the fact that, you know, England from the time that Jamestown had been founded in 1607 until Georgia's founded in 1635. So you've got a period of over 125 years as the 13 colonies are coming into existence that each of them had been founded with a different purpose, that there was no, um, there was no attempt by England to make any sort of a uniform colonial experience in the new world. So unlike the French who were here trapping and trading, but not really building cities and, or not building towns, you know, they're not bringing wives for the most part. It's not families, it's individual traders and trappers. You know, the Spanish who tend to concentrate more on Central America and South America, and they're in Florida and they're in what would be uh, become the American Southwest. But, but they're more into God, gold, and glory, and it's a very different experience. What you find found preceding the French and Indian War was basically a period of benign neglect. England didn't ignore us. England just simply didn't control us, and it allowed for three to four, in some cases five generations, of pretty much independence. And when you think about that, the majority of the people who are coming in where they're they're English or they are English who've gone to the Netherlands and then have come here or, or they're Scots or Irish early on, German, Pennsylvania Dutch as they'll be called, but German ancestry. There's a tremendous amount of independence. You'll remember that when the French and Indian War occurs that even prior to the war, there had been some talk of trying to unify those sort of disparate colonies. Benjamin Franklin, had in 1754 come up with the idea of the Albany Plan of Union, and he was able to get representatives from seven of the 13 colonies. Georgia didn't show up, the Carolinas didn't show up, they're so far away, and then there were other colonies that didn't, but seven of the 13 will show up uh, to talk about issues, including what he sees as the coming war. Remember that what we call the French and Indian War, the Europeans call the Seven Years' War, and it actually began in 1754 in Europe. And he knew the conflict between the English and the French were going to, was going to erupt here too. And so he proposed what he called the, uh, the Plan of Union, which would have been a loose confederation, no strong central government, but a loose confederation of the 13 colonies and while that never came into being, that idea of there being at some point in the future a unification remained part of the story. Now, when the French and Indian War that we talked about last week ended, Great Britain had this tremendous war debt. They needed money to pay that war debt and 
they began to, in Parliament, the debate centered on the fact of, well, we spent all this money going to North America because we were there. Yes, it was an outgrowth of the Seven Years' War that was here on the continent. You know, they were fighting in India, even in the Philippines. The French and the English and the Austrians got involved and the Prussians. You know, it was really the first global war. But in Parliament's mind, as they began to debate, they would not have had to come to North America. There would not have been the conflict with the French here if it had not been for the English colonies. So therefore, the English colonies ought to be the ones that pay for the war. Prior to that period, prior to 1763, England had not taxed the 13 colonies. The 13 colonies paid taxes, but that tax money stayed locally to fund, and it was a limited tax, but what taxes were raised stayed locally for local improvements. Um, and often that tax was not in the form of money, it was often in the form of labor, so that you can go back and look at the records, and you'll see where someone was assessed 10 days of work to help build a road or they were assessed seven days of work to help build a bridge, or they were assessed you know, four days of labor because we're building a, a, a jail in a community or whatever. And it was often that labor or bringing stone in or you know, different people were assessed based on the resources that they might have on the land that they owned. And the idea of cash taxation is a new sort of post French and Indian war that occurs in the American colonies. Well, the American colonists are, are one, nobody wants to be taxed. Let's just be really honest. I mean, most all of us will say, well, I'm perfectly willing to pay the taxes that are necessary for those things that I think are necessary. Um, but I expect for it to be a reasonable tax and I expect everyone to pay their fair share and I'm probably not going to sing hallelujah as I pay my taxes because it just hurts sometimes. Well, that's true in the 1700s, in the 18th century also. And the other problem that most of the colonists had was we're being assessed for the cost of bringing the British army to North America to fight against the French and their allies, most of the Indians who are their allies. And the reality is that the British army had not been a big help. That's the colonial impression. The British army had not been a great, tremendous help in fighting the French and Indian War because the fighting that they were used to on the continent, you know, all those rules of engagement where you line your men up and you sound the drums and you play the fife and you let everybody know that the army is marching forward and then you keep those rows and everybody kneels and fires and then all of that on the frontier, you know, after three and four generations of being on the frontier, having learned from our native neighbors, fighting in the wilderness is a very different sort of thing. You know, you go back and you read some of the accounts of the French and Indian War and you'll find commentary, even George Washington, who in, you know, is a 21 year old Lieutenant when the war begins, comments on the fact that as much as he wants a commission in the British army, he, he's a little, and it's a combination of bemused and he just thinks it's sort of ridiculous. Here they are in the wilderness wearing bright red. Here they are in the wilderness in the afternoons at four o'clock, they ring bells and everybody stops fighting and the officers retire to their tents and their aide de camps bring out tea and they have tea in the afternoon. And you don't fight at night because that's not considered to be a civilized way of fighting. Well, on the frontier, what you'll find is following the French and Indian War, you'll find those who are veterans of that war saying things like, the war would not have been won if it had not been for the colonial fighters. You know, most of the war was, was fought in the wilderness. It was fought using new military techniques. It was fought being stealth, moving quietly in, in the wilderness. You know, all you have to do is go back and look at Last of the Mohegans. I think I mentioned that last week. I, get, I have to mention Daniel Day-Lewis and Last of the Mohegans at least twice every fall. Um, but you look at that technique of fighting and that silence of fighting and not just using musket fire, because let's be really honest, muskets are loud, muskets are smoky, you know, the fire shoots out. 
but having adopted from the native people the idea of using tomahawks and using knives in combat where the British are gonna fix a bayonet to their muskets, the, those who have trained, those who live on the frontier, Western Pennsylvania, Western uh, New York, you know, Western, the Carolinas, Virginia, all of that area, they've learned also to not just hunt animals with knives, but it's a part of actually combat carrying a knife because in the heat of battle, you can throw that knife if you're really well and it's a silent attack so that you can take out a sentry or whatever. So anyway, the colonists are really ticked that, that the British are going to raise money by taxing them. Um, and then when the war ends, and I think, yes, when we stopped last week, the thing that I was mentioning was the Proclamation of 1763. So Proclamation 1763, we signed the Peace Treaty, the Peace of Paris 1763. But then Great Britain issues a proclamation that basically says very clearly colonists are not allowed to settle west of the Appalachian Mountains or west of the Allegheny Mountains. Well, that doesn't go over very, very well because one of the things as you have more and more people coming into the 13 colonies, you know, there's not a lot of cash money. That's not something that people have so much. Land is money. I mean, today land is money and land, you know, that idea of property, you think about John Locke, when John Locke is writing the two treatises on government, he says life, liberty, and property. He doesn't say the pursuit of happiness. That's sort of nebulous. Locke says life, liberty, and property. Well, property, the idea that you can't move westward, that you can't for your family claim land on the frontier is really, really annoying. Um, and then you couple that with the fact that by April of 1764, Britain puts a tax on sugar and certain luxuries. And sugar was considered to be a luxury. If you were on the frontier, more often than not, you, you didn't have a lot of sugar. You were going to use cane sugar if you lived in a climate where you could grow cane, and that's going to be more of your southern colonies. You used honey or you simply sugars were held for something very, very special. So if you were importing any sort of sugar, now there's gonna be a taxation on sugar. And that really upsets a lot of the colonists because why are you taxing my food? You know, food is necessary for life. So a taxation on that, it seems to be inappropriate. So that's April of 1764. In less than a year, because the, the colonists are not paying those taxes on sugar and other luxury sorts of ideas, uh, glass, certain kinds of paper, you know, things that were not common that, that needed to be for the most part imported, the colonists just simply quit buying it. So they're not raising taxes with that. So what the British parliament decides to do in March of 1765, is they pay, pass a piece of legislation called the Quartering Act. And the Quartering Act said that for the British Army, they're going to send troops. They had sent troops during Pontiac's Rebellion, which was in 1764, sort of simultaneous with the Sugar Act. The British had sent British troops to help put down Pontiac's Rebellion, which was a, a native rebellion that occurs on the Western frontier. Well, it's expensive taking care of soldiers. They have to have daily rations. They have to have, you know, quarters. They have, whether it's tents or you build barracks, primitive sorts of barracks. Those of you that have been to Valley Forge can kind of get an idea of what barracks look like in the 19th century. Well, the British Parliament passes a piece of legislation, March of 1765, the Quartering Act that says British troops will be quartered in the homes of colonists. So if you had a house, and let's say I have a house and I have two bedrooms, you know, I have a dog trot and I have basically living quarters and a little kitchen, and then I have a couple of rooms, then I have to take in two soldiers. Not only am I providing them with shelter, but I also have to feed them. Now, I'm not being reimbursed for the cost of feeding them. And that's a big deal for a lot of the colonists because 
as a rule, those soldiers are going to be young men. And those of us who have had sons who in their late teens, early 20s or whatever, seem to be able to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And so this quartering act that required the colonists to provide shelter and food for troops really smacks of a different way of getting tax dollars. So the England's not going to pay for their soldiers. They're going to let the colonists pay for having soldiers here. The other thing that creates a problem with the quartering act is, so in my home, I now have two representatives of the English crown who are there and that stifles my freedom of speech just a bit because how am I going to feel free to talk about issues related to government, to talk about the Quartering Act, to talk about taxation if I have representatives of the English military living in my home? I'm, I'm not going to like that. I would tell you that would make me very uncomfortable. And I think it made most colonists uncomfortable if we go back and we look at, at the things that they wrote. Well, that's March of 1765. Parliament follows that up within days after passing the Quartering Act with passing the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act was a taxation on all printed material. So I'm going to not just, you know, I'm printing a document a will, a deed, you know, all those sorts of primary documents that you have to have to be able to, um, to give wealth to someone else, to give land. You know, I have my beloved child and I'm going to give him so many acres for the equivalent of one pound or whatever, but you have to have a document doing that. Thank God they have documents. That's what we use to establish genealogical connections. But all of those now are going to have to have a legal stamp and you're going to pay a tax for that stamp. In opposition to the Stamp Act, even more so than the Quartering Act, in March of 1765, the Sons of Liberty will be created as a group, and they will originate in Massachusetts. Um, we always like to talk about, you know, the, those founding 13 colonies. Virginia always talks about they're the first colony. You know, it's Virginia you know, the birthplace of presidents and everything in Massachusetts will always say, well, you know, it's Massachusetts because Boston is the birthplace of fire. You know, that's where you're going to have the reaction. And of course, both of them are very true. So the Sons of Liberty are formed as a secret society and they are in opposition to the Stamp Act in particular and they, they take as their motto that line from the Magna Carta that is no taxation without representation. That's in March. By that October, so October of 1765, yay though this many years ago in the cool weather of October, they call a Stamp Act Congress. And the invitation to attend the Stamp Act Congress comes out to all the colonies from Massachusetts and nine of the colonies show up for this one. And they in the Stamp Act Congress declare that only elected officials of the English colonies in North America can approve and can implement taxes. We are not, their argument is parliament cannot assess taxes on the English colonies because we have no representation there. That no representation, no taxation without representation. So only local colonies can assess taxation on residents of the local colony. So Massachusetts can tax the Massachusetts um, residents. Virginia can tax Virginia. Maryland can tax Maryland, so on and so forth. And they will become so strong in their boycott of doing anything that requires the Stamp Act. They're not buying sugar, they're not buying glass, and now they're just not gonna do documents. They're gonna go to oral transactions that the Stamp Act will be repealed late um, in March, about six months later, March of 1766. But Britain finds itself forced to repeal that act. But I've got to tell you, it's so funny because they repeal the act. And then four days later, they pass something called the Declaratory Act. And I love the Declaratory Act. It always makes me think of that parent who's like, 
Okay, I gave in, but I just want you to know I'm still in control. You may have forced my hand, but I'm the parent. So the Declaratory Act, which is passed in March of 1766, says Great Britain has the right to make any laws that it wants to regarding the residents in Britain and in any of its colonial uh, territories. We can, we make the laws, tax officials, you know, if you have to treat our tax officials right because there had apparently been some incidents of, of those who were representing the crown who were still trying to enforce the Stamp Act prior to its repeal where those tax collectors had been hanged in effigy, not actually hanged. A couple had been tarred and feathered, but none of them had actually been hanged. You know, no life had been taken, but you know, those, those angry mobs in the colonies had made their little stuffed dummies and hanged them from trees with signs around their necks that says that you, this is what awaits the tax collector. And the king in signing that act that came out of parliament, the declaratory act signs basically a statement that says, I'd like to remind you, I am George the third. I am the third of the Hanoverian kings and I am your king and you will do what I tell you to do or there will be repercussions. And I mean, I, it really does sort of sound like the angry father saying, remember who's in charge. Well, 1767, um, the Townsend Acts are passed. The money, the taxation money is not coming in. Parliament is angry. They still have this tremendous debt. Now, the truth of the matter is much of that debt is from the, on, the war that has been ongoing with France. And on the continent, it's not just the money that they've spent in North America, but they need, they need more tax money and they're not getting it. So they're going to double down. It's sort of like, okay, you're not doing what I want you to do. Well, now I'm really going to make you do what I want you to do. So 1767, the Townsend Acts are passed. And Townsend is the Cheshire, which is like the treasurer for the crown, um, has a parliamentary function. And so he's the one who identifies what the taxation ought to be. And so the tax bears his name, the Townsend Acts, and they put a tax on imported tea, they increase the tax on glass and increase the tax on paper. Um, they suspend the New York Assembly because New York has taken a unified action and they have proclaimed they're not quartering any soldiers. And so there has been a boycott all across New York of people locking their doors, turning the soldiers out and saying, not quartering you in our houses. They, have, they are standing together in unity and it really makes parliament angry. So they suspend, they shut down the New York assembly, the state, the colonial assembly, and they bar the doors and tell them that they're not gonna be able to meet. And then the thing that they do under the Townsend Act that really gets a lot of people upset is they issue something called a general license or a writ of assistance is the technical name and what it gives the authority to representatives of the crown to unannounced appear at people's homes and search their homes for smuggled goods, paper, sugar, stamps, glass, tea in particular. Um, and what you find as a result of that is this whole idea that has been part of common law that my home, I may be poor and my home may not be very large, but my home is my castle. And you don't come into my home unless you have some true evidence that there is a reason to come into my home, to have blanket writs of assistance where randomly any homes can be searched, hoping to find some evidence that I've done something wrong, gets the colonies really, really angry, gets the colonists angry. As a result of that, in the fall of 1767 and 1768, a group of anonymous writers get together and we know now that John Dickinson 
James Wilson, a couple of others, especially out of Pennsylvania, not just one author, but several, and there will begin to appear in, news, in the newspapers, in the printed press across the colonial uh, world, what will be called letters from a Pennsylvania farmer. And they are anonymous letters that basically question what Parliament is doing. And the consistent assessment in these letters from a Pennsylvania farmer from Dickinson is that taxes cannot be levied without consent of the colonial representatives. You know, you may tax the colonies, but you may only tax the colonies if representatives of the colonies are seated in Parliament you do not have the right as we are English citizens, that's gonna be the argument. We are English citizens simply not living on English land. You cannot tax English citizens without them having a voice in the taxation. And out of those letters from a Pennsylvania farmer will come something that's gonna be called the circular letter that begins in February of 1768, which is sent to each of the 13 colonies, to their legislative assemblies. They, they look a little different in each colony, but they each have, you know, in Virginia, it's the House of Burgesses. You know, in Georgia, it's the Assembly of Notables, but you know, they all have assemblies. And it is asking each of those, those colonial assemblies to draft a document that they will send to Parliament, urging Parliament to repeal the Townsend Act. And what happens is that's February of 1768 in March of 1770. So it takes two years of negotiating back and forth and back and forth. The Townsend Acts will be repealed in March of 1770, except on tea. Um, because tea is considered to be a mainstay of the British way of life. You know, everybody gets up and you have tea in the morning and you have tea in midday and then you have tea in the afternoons. And if you're from a well-to-do family, you have high tea. So you have tea and cakes and crumpets and all sorts of things. And because tea is so much a part of the lifestyle, they repeal the tax on everything except tea because they know that people are going to still want to drink their tea. So that's March of 1770. Um, and one of, you know, the, the port cities are then going to become critical. The Bostons, the Charlestons, the Savannas, um, you know, the, the, the James River areas in Virginia, um, New York City, you know, wherever Portsmouth in New Hampshire, the areas that are uh, port cities, because that's where the tea is going to come in because we're not growing tea in this country. The climate is not appropriate. Tea is most often grown in the West Indies, in the East Indies, in India itself. And so that tea has to be imported, which means it's coming in on British ships and we're going to have to pay for that tea. Well, when, when the tea tax is still in place, what you're going to have is an incident that occurs in Boston. And I, I think all of us remember it from our days in school, but in March of 1770, um, you have an incident in which a crowd of colonists began to harass British guards near a customs house. And that's important. A customs house, of course, it would be where the goods would come in. The taxes would be assessed on that. And then people who came into the customs house to buy are paying that importation tax on tea predominantly. So, you know, March the 5th in Boston, it's cold weather, it's snowy. You know, there are British guards at the custom house because there's money there. And colonists begin to harass those guards. We know that there, it breaks out into a fight and there are snowballs that are fired off at the guards, but it's not just snowballs the way that you might play with a sibling, you might play with a buddy, but the colonists we know are, are creating snowballs around rocks and they're throwing these kind of hard snowballs at the, the uh, British troops the guards that are standing there at the custom house. And for whatever reason, 
Um, instinctively, no one knows who sounded an order, if an order was sounded or whatever, but you have soldiers who fire into the crowd and five of those colonists are gonna be killed in what will become known as the Boston Massacre. Now, the Boston Massacre, we could spend an entire class period talking about the Boston Mass Massacre because it's fascinating. One, immediately, I mean, immediately, as quickly as you can in colonial times, Paul Revere, who is a silversmith, you know, he's a designer, all those sorts of things, does a woodcut of the Boston Massacre that shows the soldiers with their guns and it shows these bodies lying dead on the snow and everything. And that woodcut is sent to all the newspapers across the colonial uh, world. And it will be reprinted. And he is, it's, ba it's Paul Revere who coins the name Boston Massacre, which gives it certainly a very heated sort of assessment as to what had happened there, that it's a massacre. You know, armed guards have fired on unarmed civilians. Uh, interestingly, Chrysippus Attucks, one of the five who's killed, is a freed African-American. So one of the first casualties in this countdown of the revolution is indeed a, a man of color. Um, the guards who have fired on the colonists will be arrested. You know, the, the mob grabs them, they will be arrested, there's going to be a trial, but it's one of my favorite things in history to talk about because John Adams, fiery, short, little, fluffy John Adams, whom I love dearly, who is a little bit quieter than his cousin Samuel Adams, who really is a firebrand, but John Adams will volunteer to defend the British soldiers because his argument is going to be, and, and it's an argument that constitutional scholars still use today when we talk about public defenders and public prosecutors, there is no justice if both sides in this sort of a criminal case are not given the best of representation. And John Adams will represent the soldiers and there will, there will be a series of trials of the different ones. And while a couple of the soldiers will be found um, not guilty of murder, but they will be found having fired under duress and they will be sent back to England. I mean, it's a fascinating sort of, of situation that occurs. Tempers are getting hotter. And in June of 1772, you have a British ship that runs aground in Rhode Island. We don't get to talk about Rhode Island a whole lot when we're talking about uh, you know, colonial history because poor sweet little Rhode Island always feels as though they are sort of snubbed in history. They're, they're little and you know, you've got Rhode Island versus Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, the big colonies. You know, that's gonna be critical when we get to talking about constitution. But this British ship runs aground in Rhode Island and, and the residents of Rhode Island, the colonists go out and they burn the ship and they sort of beat some of the sailors who were on that ship and they destroy uh, much of the goods that were being carried aboard the Gatsby is the ship. And they destroy the goods because a lot of what that, that ship was carrying was tea and it's sort of a reaction against the Tea Act. And in response to them having done that, you know, England is just appalled. You know, he, this is a British ship in British territory in British waters and British citizens, loosely British citizens, because they're not giving us the rights of Englishmen, they have burned the ship and beat the sailors, you know, beat them about the head and shoulders with the two by four or whatever. And, you know, there is an oath taken in Rhode Island that says, even if, it, even if British tea is cheaper than Dutch tea, because the Dutch were bringing tea in from the East Indies, I will never drink British tea again. And you have this oath signed by a number of people in Rhode Island. So one of the first tea sort of boycotts officially occurs. Well, as a result of what happens there, you have the forming in, in 1772, and, and it will function until 1774, a group of people who are designated, we do not know who all of them were even still today, but in each colony, two or three people are designated to be committees of correspondence. So it's sort of like 
the early red alarm group. And when something happens in a colony, like the Gatsby is burned in Rhode Island, then that those correspondents in Rhode Island will write up what happened and those letters get sent to the other 12 colonies. So every colony has a couple or three people, especially with the bigger colonies that are gonna record what's going on. You know, what's happening? What, how are the British treating the colonists? How are the colonists responding? So they're gonna set up this sort of Patriot led underground government that's going to oppose British policies and it becomes this communication network. It's sort of like Facebook without a computer. You know, here's what happened. We're going to draw you a visual picture by using words. Well, in response to the committees of correspondence, because the British began to realize that the colonies are talking with each other and they are beginning to build this resistance, then in April of 1773, they create a new piece of legislation that takes the tax that is still remained on tea. They now pass a tea act and they increase the tax on tea. You know, if you thought we were, you were gonna have to pay a tax before, just watch because you're gonna pay even more taxes. And that leads, that's April of 1773, that will lead to what all of us remember from history in December of 1773, which will be the Boston Tea Party. Um, and it's interesting, I always love to talk about the Boston Tea Party because you know, you have this image of here the ships are pulled up into the Boston Harbor and then in the dark of night, you have the Sons of Liberty who are going to dress up as Native Americans and they're going to steal stealthily onto the ships. They are going to tie up. They, they really don't harm those sailors that are aboard the ships. They tie them up, but then they're going to dump all the tea into the harbor. They're going to destroy the cargo. It's sort of a way of saying, we're not going to drink your tea and we're not going to pay the tax for that tea. They will dump 342 large chests, what we would call shipping containers of tea into the harbor. And in today's dollars, you know, people have tried to take what the tea was worth then and to figure out it would be worth more than a million dollars as far as cargo. So obviously the, the ship owners who have sent that tea, who have gotten the tea and who have transported that tea to Boston Harbor are not happy. They are not happy. The British Crown is not happy uh, because these ships have been have been allowed to dock in Boston under the authority of the Crown. So now, and, and side note, I, I can remember I had a student one time say, "Well, why why did the Sons of Liberty dress up like Indians? They wanted to put the blame so the British would be angry at the Indians." No, that I mean that's not why they did it. We know now from looking back at some of the records that will be kept after the war where people talk about involvement in the Boston Tea Party, that they dressed up, they paint their faces, you know, they put on these costumes because under British law, you have to be able to give an eyewitness of who did what and if they are, they can't, they're not masked, but they are disguised then you can't, you've got to have two people who can give eyewitness account for someone to be prosecuted. And it was their way of avoiding prosecution, which I think is really kind of smart. I, you know, I kind of like that idea. Plus who doesn't enjoy dressing up for all sorts of things. So Boston Tea Party, December of 1773, 1774 English Parliament comes back and they are furious and they pass what will be known as the Intolerable Acts. And they are designed specifically to punish the Massachusetts colony for having allowed the tea party, the tea to be destroyed. So the Intolerable Acts basically close the port of Boston, no shipping in or out of Boston Harbor until the cost of the tea is repaid to the Crown. That's a pretty harsh sort of thing because what that does is that's an economic shutdown and it is an attempt to force 
the merchants, those who trade in Boston, and Boston is, a, you know, for the colonies is a good sized city. It is an economic stronghold and all business is going to shut down because you can't get goods in and out, only what you are producing locally. And there's not a lot being produced locally. It gave the British governor more power in the Massachusetts colony. So the royal governor in Massachusetts now has the power to be able to arrest people without necessarily indicating what the charges are against them. That's a violation of the writ of habeas corpus, but he has more control. Um, royal officials, if the local colonists accuse someone who is a tax collector or any other sort of royal official of a crime, they're not going to be tried locally. They will be returned to England and they will be tried there. So the colonial assemblies, the colonial courts have no authority over British agents. That's a big deal. And then it expanded the Quartering Act and it forced the colonists in Massachusetts to house those British soldiers in private houses. It gave the soldiers the right to use arms to force their way to be able to, to be quartered. So that's a big deal. As a result of the intolerable acts, you're going to have the first Continental Congress that's gonna be called in September and October of 1774. They're gonna meet in Philadelphia. They can't meet in Boston because Boston is basically under martial law. So they're gonna meet in Philadelphia in response. This time, 12 of the colonies will send representatives to this Congress. Georgia is the only one that doesn't and, and Georgia will later say, you know, by the time they got it all figured out, it was just too late because they meet September and October only for a two month period of time. That's September and October of 1774. Um, by the next spring, things are really beginning to heat up. So in April of 1775, you have the British troops, the word goes out that the British troops are going to be increasing in numbers in the colonies. And they are going to come into the colonies. The first huge wave of British troops are gonna come in through Boston because the English military is already in control of Boston Harbor. So the British are going to be coming into Boston and then they are going to spread out across the countryside across Massachusetts in particular, looking for weapons that are privately owned, families who have muskets, weapons that may be hidden in barns. You know, the colonial militia, the word has gotten to England that the colonial militia is beginning to train. They're meeting secretly, they are meeting out in rural environments and they are practicing marching and they are practicing, you know, firing, loading, firing quickly their muskets. They are preparing themselves and Britain sees that as a threat. You know, the colonists are beginning to arm themselves. We're going to take their arms away from them. Um, that's why the Second Amendment, when we do the Constitution, will be such a big issue in colonial for that colonial period. So the British army is gonna land in Boston. They're gonna fan out across the countryside. They're gonna start searching houses, barns, you know, smoke houses, anywhere that you might hide weapons and they're gonna confiscate all of those weapons. Um, and what will of course happen is, you know, we all know the story that the British are going to land in Boston. You know, are they going to then go out in the countryside? Are they gonna go by river? Or are they gonna go by land? So it's the whole one if by land, uh, one if by sea and, what well, I say, North Shore, one if by land and two if by sea and I on the opposite shore will be Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And of course, Paul Revere, uh, Joseph Dawes, there are several who are gonna be riding out into the countryside to spread the alarm. And they, they learn that the British are landing and that they are going to march by land. And as you are going to leave Boston, the first major area that they're gonna come into are two of those little towns. You know, Boston is surrounded by small towns. The first two towns that they're gonna come into are um, Lexington and Concord. So on the 
18th of April in 75, as Longfellow says in the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, that's when they know the British are going to be landing. On April the 19th, the British soldiers will march out toward the countryside. And when they get to Lexington and Concord, the Minutemen, and they're called Minutemen because they had trained that when the alarm is sounded, someone would ride through sounding the alarm. And of course, the alarm is the British are coming. The British are coming. They were to be able to be dressed grab their muskets from wherever they're hidden and be out the door in a minute. And they had agreed in each of those communities where the Minutemen would assemble to stand in defense. Lexington and Concord, they're going to stand in defense at the bridge that would allow the British Army then to cross over into the next community. Um, we, no one knows who fired the first shot but the British are coming, the Minutemen are lined up, and on April the 19th of 1775, shots will be fired. And as, as is so beautifully written in the Concord hymn, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, that's the shot on the rude, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, its flags to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood, and fired the shot heard round the world. So you have the colonial militia and British troops fighting in Lexington first, and then there will be a second round of fighting in Concord. 1775 to 1781, of course, you're, what you're going to have is the Continental Congress that will take control of the war. Now, how does this sort of unfold? And I'm gonna get you up to where we actually declare revolution very quickly so that we can finish all of this. So First Continental Congress will has met for their two months. They're gonna come back and they are now the second Continental Congress. Now we're gonna have all 13 colonies present. And the first action they do is that they declare themselves to be the independent government in charge of the war. And they will appoint George Washington that person who had been the young lieutenant at the beginning of the French and Indian War, who has gained a lot of, of expertise during the French and Indian War because he made some fairly significant boo-boos during that conflict, but he has learned and he has grown and he is now going to be the head of the colonial army. So the next major thing that will occur will be in June of 1775 when you have the Battle of Bunker Hill, which actually occurs on Breed's Hill, but who cares? You know, Bunker Hill, we're still in Massachusetts. So you've got the Massachusetts militia and the British troops fighting outside of Boston. And while it is technically considered to be a British victory, it actually, the, the militia was, they were able to hold the British army off and actually force them to retreat. And so it's a real morale booster. Now, what I want you to know is that even at that point, no one really wanted a war and no one was talking about an independent nation. In fact, in July of 1775, the Second Continental Congress will send a document to George III called the Olive Branch Petition. Now, we all know that you extend the olive branch when you are extending a branch in hopes of peace. Let's reconcile. So they send a letter to King George III, and it's a petition signed by representatives of all 13 colonies saying, we don't want to separate from England. We are English citizens. All we want is to be treated as English citizens with the rights that were established in the Magna Carta that were affirmed in the English Bill of Rights. We just wanna be treated like English citizens and we want to be represented in parliament. George III receives the Olive Branch petition and on the floor of Parliament tears it apart and never reads it, never reads it. I mean, I just, and of course, what he will later say, we all know George III was a little loopy anyway. He actually had some serious mental issues. We know now, people didn't know so much then. But what he says is, who are the people to petition me? I am their king. I'm the king of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Who do they think? 
that's important because this is an attempt, sort of a last attempt by the colonists, by all 13 colonies to say, we don't want to fight. We don't want a war. We just want to be treated right. That occurs in July of 1775. In January of 1776, Thomas Paine writes Common Sense, and he writes a couple of other essays. And, and that, I want to read you an excerpt. I know we don't have much time, but I want to read you an excerpt from what Thomas Paine writes um, because it becomes this sort of voice of revolution. So Thomas Paine writes, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. And he goes on to say, it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain with an army to enforce her tyranny has declared that she has the right not only to tax, but to bind us, and this is a quote actually from one of George III's proclamations, to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, then there is not such a thing as slavery upon this earth. Even the expression is impious. For so unlimited a power over man can only belong to God. Whether the independence of this continent is declared too soon or delayed too long, I will now not enter into an argument. My own simple opinion is it would be much better. We have not made the proper use of last winter However, the fault is our own. And then he goes on, his final statement is to say, I cannot see upon what grounds the King of Britain can look up to heaven for help against us. A common murderer, a highwayman, a housebreaker has as good a pretense at rule as does he. Whoa, common, you know, common sense and and his idea that the time has come that we're gonna to have to make that decision. I'm gonna stop there today. When we come back next week, that's January of 1776. There are going to be continued attempts, letters from individual colonies saying, you know, let's, let's talk, let's, let's sit down, let's have a representation of the colonies with parliament. And let's talk about the future of our relationship. Each of those attempts will be rebuffed. So when we come back together on next Tuesday, the Second Continental Congress will put together a subcommittee that will be John Adams, Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia, Adams of Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, and the youngest member of that subcommittee, a young man from Virginia named Thomas Jefferson, and they will be charged with how do we explain why we are going to take the action that we're going to take, and what is that action, and how will the Second Continental Congress respond to the document that is created by that committee? You and I both know Thomas Jefferson, the youngest member will end up being the one who will be the writer of most of it. Adams and Franklin, Sherman and Livingston will have input, and then they'll go away and leave Jefferson with the incredible ability to express what has been building up in the colonies now for a period of 12 years, almost 13 by the time that it's actually written. So when we come back next week, 
we're going to take a look at the Declaration of Independence, and then we will begin to truly fight the war that up until this point has simply been a couple of skirmishes. So I'm kind of excited. And well, at least I haven't run over, but I didn't do a whole lot better on finishing early. But I would love, you know, if you have, even if you have questions and comments and you want to send things to me between classes, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, uh, you know, I always tell people, we did not go easily into revolution. We attempted to avoid it, but once the die was cast, we will go in to revolution truly with the belief that man is inherently governed best when he's governed least and when he has a voice in his own determination. So talk to me folks. I know time is up and it's about time to sign off and everything, but I have so enjoyed being together with you on this crisp, cool autumn day, thinking about the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party and that shot heard all the way around the world. We are indeed, as you know, as Winthrop said, perhaps that city on the hill. Thank you all so much for being here and come back next week and we're going to revolt. Everybody needs to bring with you your weapon of choice. I'll have my 13 star flag ready to go. Thank you all so much for being here today and I hope you have a lovely rest of the week. You've brought tears to our eyes. Oh, <laughs> oh. Wonderful. well, thank, thank you. you. I, I mean, American history is just profound. Yeah. I, I love being able for us to all share it together. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this was great. Thank well, you. Well, drink your coffee. That's why we don't drink tea for the most part in this That's country. Right. We will begin to drink coffee instead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you well, soon. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you again on November 2nd. So we'll Can see you believe it's November? No. no, no. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.